Blog Talk Radio. And here we go. Hello? Yeah. All right, welcome to That Nerd Show's interview series that is now a daily nerd show. Uh, since we have been getting a lot of requests for interviews out there, uh, we decided to do kind of a daily nerd show so you can get your nerd fix uh, and do part of our interview series that way. I'm your host, Marcus Blake, and with me today for our very first uh, interview series is Director Mark Rasso. Say hi to our audience, Mark. Hello, thanks for having me. Well, we thank you for uh, coming on our show. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes, we're going to give you our airwaves, and we're going to talk about your new film, Copenhagen. And I was sorry that we didn't get a chance to interview at the Dallas International Film Festival, but this is even better. So anyway, uh, thanks again for uh, being on the show. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your first feature film. Uh, we've had a chance to view it, and uh, very, very impressive, Mark. And I think our for, for our very first question, we want to know how did you you wrote and directed this film? Uh, what is the story behind you with this movie? Um, I guess it's a long story, but it started uh, when I lived in Copenhagen in 2007. My wife's from there, and um, I just kind of fell in love with the city. It's a, I don't know for anyone who's been, it's a it's a wonderful, youthful city especially in the summertime when um because of the the uh latitude um you know the sun sets for about four hours every evening right. so you kind of have magical summer summer nights so that was kind of the the, the genesis of the story is my time there and just kind of noticing that this this youthful culture that that um that really lives strong there um and then right after that i ended up going to columbia university uh, in New York for film school, and it was while I was there in one of my classes, I started penning the story, writing it, um, you know, bringing it through classes, and it kind of evolved from there into uh, a much more personal journey. Um, you know, it often gets compared to, uh, to like, the Before Sunrise movies and stuff like that, but right. I think there's something, you know, deeper and uh, and very, you know, it, it's really a story about growing up, and, uh, you know, that that kind of came through once I, I really looked looked inward into into where I wanted to go in the future and what and you know what kind of person I wanted to be. Okay, uh, so uh, William, the main character who's traipsing around uh, Copenhagen and uh, finding out information about his family, uh, since most writers tend to write what they know or base stories upon themselves, is this character very much like you? <laughs> No, I was gonna say unfortunately not. I don't know if I should say unfortunately, but I mean, if you see the movie, he's, you know. Okay, well, you know, we're not trying to put you on the spot or anything. But um, no, he's, he's quite he's quite unlikable to begin with. But you know, it is based on people I know. Um, okay. In term in terms of of his character, but his journey is definitely there's something um, thematically that relates to me. You know that that my my kind of trying to understand my family's history and stuff like that. But in terms of how he acts, uh, no, no, it's not based on me. <laughs> don't don't tell me that you have a friend that's that asshole friend that you're like, I'm going to write a character about you and put it in a movie. I'm just waiting for him to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, being a writer myself, yeah, I've got a few friends that are always asking me the same thing. Like, uh, am I am I in one of your books or anything you're doing? Like, you might be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you write what you know. Um, exactly. So, and yes, there is a there's definitely a um, uh, a Lolita theme going on in this film, and I and I do want to get to that in a moment, but. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that struck me about this, and this one's kind of a personal one for me, because I I'm Danish and Irish on my father's side, and my um, my father's last name is Omgren, and we had family come from Denmark, and I've still got family there, and completely understand what you're talking about with the city of Copenhagen. But okay. for William, part of his journey is definitely 
finding out who he is by trying to find out more about his family and the long lost uh, grandfather. Have you ever personally gone through something like that to where you put that in the, the story? Um, not quite like that. No, I have a, I have an interesting family history. I mean, both my parents were um, born in Italy and, and moved over when they were teenagers and my grandfather had um had fought in the um in the second world war and he was he was in germany i believe when italy kind of switched sides and he became a prisoner there suddenly halfway through and after the war ended he had stayed there and you know we had heard that he um he had a family for a few years and then he moved back to italy a few years after that he met my grandmother so i know that in my, I know that there's someone out there, um, right? You know, but I've never taken the time to track them down, or I've never, you know, it, it's it, when my grandfather passed away, a lot of that information left with him, um, and so I don't think that's real uh, realistic to find it. Um, but you know, it's always been in the back of my head, and so that was definitely like the the impetus for for this kind of journey is that. You know, I know that there's someone out there. I guess it would be a great uncle or or or, or an right. aunt or an right. uncle or an aunt or something. You know, um, that that I have no idea. Of. Well, I I think it makes a great theme for a story because I mean, if for us to kind of find who we are as people, we, you know, we have to understand our where we come from, our family, especially if they weren't around. Um, <laughs> and there's a very very catharsis moment at the end when he finally finds his long lost uh, grandfather and and I'm not going to spoil the movie on this show. I know for <laughs> fans. Yeah. Are, is he about to spoil something? No, no, no. We're not going to we're just telling you it's a catharsis, but you probably already figured that out. Our our fans are kind of I I would like to think our fans are uh, smart. Um yeah. and all I have to do is read the IMDb information and to know that there is that going on. But anyway, uh and but like I said, I, I found it very, you know, cathartic. And his conversation when he finally finds his uh, grandfather uh, and stuff. And yeah. again, kind of getting back to the uh, personal. So this this is a remarkable film um, from so many different standpoints. Because uh, my my great grandfather was that guy too, who just kind of <laughs> ran out on his own family and. You know, my grandfather didn't really have an example on how to be a father um, on my dad's side. And, you know, <laughs> when you're confronted with that, what do you really say to a character? Or, I mean, what do you really say to a person like this? You know, between all the <laughs> anger and then trying to understand. Um, do you think that this is the point where, you know, you say this film's about growing up, but do you think this is about or, or the point where Will finally kind of grows up? Or is it really the relationship with the female uh, character Effie in the film? I think um, I, I think he grew, I think it's the relationship. You know, that's that's where the the change happens, and this is just you know we see it. We see his response uh, in this moment when he finally gets to confront the grandfather. But it's definitely supposed to be about their relationship, and as much as she helps him grow up, he's helping her. You know, be a be a kid again. You know, this this character right. is mature beyond his years, um, and kind of complete opposite of him. You know, um, this dynamic going on. But I think you know, I think there's a few moments in the film. Um, one kind of in the climax of the film, not to give it away, right. and the other one at the end where we see his growth. Um, you know, that scene that scene with the grandfather was really tricky because you want to stay really real to the characters and, and, uh, you know, you don't want to make it this sappy kind of thing happening. And it's, it's very bittersweet, I would say, you know, and it is cathartic, right. but it is, it, it's an interesting scene. It was a very interesting scene to write. Um, I think, you know, I'm very confident that it was handled right. And, and, and it was basically what you might really expect that conversation to be like. Well, no, I I think uh, again because I do have some personal history and saw that mm -hmm. kind of spun out throughout this film. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I mean, this is why I think it's a remarkable film. You're, 
our natural human reaction is going to be out of anger. It's not going to be let's hug our lost long grandfather who abandoned our family or anything like that. It's trying to yeah. understand why. And we, as human beings, I believe, you know, we we feel more things out of anger, especially when you're dealing with abandonment, than we would with acceptance and love and all that. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the two actors, um, um, and we know, uh, I'm, and I apologize to our audience if I'm mispronouncing, Geth and Anthony, we all know him as, on a nerd show from Game of Thrones. Um, mm-hmm. But the other actor who played the grandfather, how did, when you guys came down to filming this scene and preparing for it, tell us a little bit about what it went into that and the conversations you have as a director with these two actors. It was very interesting, actually. Um, yeah, Geffen was great, and the, the grandfather is, he's a Danish actor, and he had requested something very interesting, which is he didn't want to meet Geffen before he kind of opened the door for the first time. So they didn't right. have any rehearsal. Um, and it was off-putting for Geffen at first, you know, and he kind of was like, and it just worked so well um, in the scene because they didn't have the opportunity to kind of, you know, bond over this, the, the the craft table or, you know, have a cigarette together or whatever they would might do right. and get to know each other. So there was this, like, natural animosity kind of kind of built in there already that, <laughs> that just played wonderfully. And then after, like, Gethin, Gethin was so happy. He was he was just so happy that that the, the older actor, uh, Previn, his name is Previn, approached it in this way. Um, and he was a fantastic, you know, he had a, he had a very tragic story. His brother was, um, part of like the Danish resistance in the war and, 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 right. um, uh, disappeared, you know, in like November and they found him in the spring when the snow melted and it was very personal for him too. You know, he's obviously on the opposite end of it, but it was just a, it was just a wonderful thing that he brought to the table and he really made it he really made it work. Um, so I give him a lot of credit for that because, you know, as a director, I would have probably just approached it like I would have any other scene, you know, let's sit down, let's talk about the beats, let's figure out where the scene turns and, and go from there. But right. it was very grateful. It was, it was a learning experience for me as well to, to see this approach. And I wouldn't do that in every scene, but this is definitely a scene where that kind of approach really paid off. Well, and I think, you know, having that kind of tension between uh, these, you know, two actors already, I mean, yeah, I mean, it definitely enhances uh, what, you know, what the scene is and makes it uh, much more believable. Um, did You know, I, I know uh, most of your uh, uh, the actors come are, are Danish actors. Um, mm-hmm. Had you ever... Uh, and there's a lot of wonderful Danish actors out there now that, you know, names that we know, like uh, Mads Mikkelsen, who, you know, is on yeah. Hannibal on NBC and um, and stuff. How, what is the difference, is there a big difference in dealing, uh, in being able to direct actors from, you know, a place like Denmark compared to actors like Gethin who, you know, come up, or English actors come, or are classically trained in everything and how they mm-hmm. approach stuff? I yeah. mean, is there a big is there a big difference? It's a huge difference, actually. It's a, it's a great question. It's a huge difference, um, and I think it's, I think it's there's three parts to it. I had worked mostly with uh, U.S. actors, and Gethin's trained out of uh, London, and his approach is very different, also than U.S. actors. And then the Danish approach is is extremely different. I would say, um, and the best way to sum it up, and I, I don't know if people will understand it or not, is that the actors in Denmark, they act kind of from their heart, um, mm-hmm. whereas whereas maybe the North American or the UK actors act a little bit more from their head. And maybe that sounds disparaging, and I don't mean it to, but what I mean is they really think through the scene, what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to right. you know, get out of things, which is good, and which is the way I'm kind of taught to, to approach working with actors. But the Danish actors, they brought something very raw, uh, raw to it, and it's very emotional. They really embodied the characters, and you know, no, no two, no two takes were the same. I found with the majority of the Danish actors, which is, 
can be very frustrating on the day and very frustrating in a way when you're editing, especially combined with Seth who, you know, hits his marks every time. He's picking up that cup of coffee at the same point and everything and seamlessly able to edit it. But, but you just have so much variation and so many choices after the fact. And they're really exploring the, exploring the world in a way that's, that's quite unique. And you hear about that, like certain U.S. actors who kind of right. have that approach. Um, I think it's a strain on them. I think mentally it's a strain. Like the character who played Effie, she kind of embodied that role. That And Effie is the, the, the lead, lead, uh, lead female character for those who, who don't know. Mm-hmm. But she kind of became her, you know, on and off the set in a way. And it, it's, it's really mentally exhausting, but it is a, a, a definitely different approach. Um, so it's interesting. Well, I don't think there are, I don't think there's any wrong or right way to approach it. I mean, as long as you are, you know, getting what you need with that performance. Oh, I mean, yeah. uh, Daniel Day Lewis is a great example. I mean, somebody who basically lives his character for five months, you know, mm-hmm. while, you know, he's doing a film. Um, but you no, know, you we we have a reoccurring theme on our show and talking about the differences between. English actors and American actors, um, and I always like to apply it. I mean, I'm I'm the writer on this show. I mean, I I don't do any acting or anything like that. I'm, but there's a great saying that you know the first time that you write something, you always write it from your heart. You know that first draft, and then you put it away for a while, and then you and then you go back and do it with your head. Um, I what you're talking about, I kind of see that concept, the difference between actors. I mean. English, because of the way you're trained, you know, it's all in your head and, you know, you're looking at the technical aspects, whereas Scandinavian actors is like, we are going to feel our way through this because that's the best way to bring out that performance. And yeah. how do you bridge those gaps to making a great film? Um, you definitely, definitely see the emotion. I mean, and then other than against, Catherine, I mean, the emotion is, is fantastic and all that, but I see what you're mm-hmm. saying with the Scandinavian yeah. actors and, and stuff. Um it's a different it's a different approach. I mean they they you know, uh Frederica our, our lead who played Effie, she you know, she not to be again, not to be disparaging, but it's a learning curve for her. She had done some feature films before. She's a very accomplished actor. She didn't really know her lines the first few days. Um she right. knew the gist of what she was trying to do and, and it was you know, this was a micro budget film. We had to go. We didn't have time for that exploration and, and she quickly had to adjust to kind of a more North American style of shooting. And she had told me like, yeah, her last film, she was just like, you know, given as much time as she needed to get the scene right. And, and that's not what we were doing. So, so she quickly adapted and kind of like at the bare minimum <laughs> knew her lines going into the scene, which is <laughs> you'd think would be obvious, but it, it wasn't, you know, that's not, and I don't want to talk for all Danish actors, but that was my, that was my experience on this film, you know. Um, <laughs> kind of a crash course, and like, well, this is what you got to do in dealing with everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, and 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 to give her credit, this is the first time she's uh, acting in another language, so it's not quite as easy as. Oh, movie, okay. But, yeah. Wow. Well, she was actually uh, she was very wonderful in the film. I mean, um, you can. Oh yeah. I will. I will say this after I've, I've seen the film twice now. Um, you know, you watch it the first time to enjoy, and then you watch it back to make your notes when you're about to interview the director. We like that. We like to come prepared, you know, for our audience. But um, I definitely see the chemistry between her and Gethin and, uh, and and everything, and working very well uh, with everything. Which you know, there's a lot of funny scenes where you can see that immaturity in his character, and you know, she, you know, you talk about her, be, you know, wise beyond her years and more mature, where she is kind of the more mature person in the situation, and which is kind of weird because she is, you know, younger as a character. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask about, like I said, the Lolita theme um, mm-hmm. uh, within this. There's not a lot of people when they write that touch on it anymore because it's still considered taboo and controversial. Um, why did you... Because you can obviously have her be 17 in the movie, and I know I'm kind of giving away a little, but mm-hmm. 
Why did you write her as a younger person when you did this film? Um, so there's two reasons. I mean, the first reason I got the idea was because I was with my wife in uh, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, at a bar one time, and she was basically telling me that, oh, yeah, my cousin's going to come and meet up with us later. I said, okay, cool. She has, you know, this cousins or three of them, they're sisters. I thought the 24, 25-year-old one was going to show up, and it was the 15-year-old who showed up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, walked right into the bar, right to the bar, ordered a drink, and just kind of like, okay, what's going on? I kind of questioned this, and I was like, oh, no, this is very normal in, in Copenhagen. You start going to bars right. and stuff, you know, 14, 15, 16. So that's kind of the idea. But what was um, more you know, what was more important or wh- wh- why the reason I chose that was because I felt like if we're watching him grow up and this is what the story is about, him, you know, breaking that cyclical pattern and and really maturing, um, then we need, I needed there to be a conflict, a conflict of you know, a reason why they couldn't be together. Right. Um, and And this is, this is what it was for me. Um, and if she was 18, 19, 20, and even though his character is supposed to be 27 in the film, you know, it's like, so what? Um, it's, it's, it's maybe it's okay. Um, right. So, you know, it was important for me that, that, that there was something um, taboo about the relationship. And, you know, it, from his perspective, and I thought that it's, you know, equally interesting that for her it's not quite as big deal as it as is as it's not in Denmark. You know, the age of majority is fifteen in Denmark. Um, right. and you know, so it's I want to look at it from two different perspectives. Um and that's why I kind of chose that. And and it's also about, you know, there's a line in the film where I think his he says his father left him when he was fourteen, fifteen years old. And it was right. important for me to kind of reference that as as a point where he he stopped growing emotionally, you know, um, right. And that's kind of his his maturity, even though he's twice that age now. That's his maturity level. So, so that's kind well, of where I came up. With, it's with it's the line there. of innocence in the film. Yeah. It's if you cross that line, then you ruin the innocence that she should, she is supposed to have at you know. 14 going on 15 and kind of for him who doesn't doesn't seem to really care about anything except himself you know the the guy that really has no morals for him this is the the line in the sand this is where i'm going to draw the moral you know for myself the line for you know more of morality and i won't cross that um Mm -hmm. i may not have many other moral you know (laughs) moral issues but this is the one i'm not going to cross and, yeah. Well, and I, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, from a symbolism standpoint, it's absolutely brilliant about you know where you are. Um, and I think fourteen or fifteen is about the time that we start to kind of cross that threshold. You know, here in America, fourteen, fifteen year olds are in high school. You know, you're do, you're doing driver's ed and about to get your driver's license. You know, in yeah. Europe, you're much more adult. You can hang out in bars. Um, you know. I think because I'm Scandinavian and Irish, I, I do. I think for me personally, I was about 14 the first time I got hammered, and I got hammered with my dad on Guinness yeah. and Carlsberg <laughs> beer. Oh yeah, it's good. So, One yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We've got to celebrate both cultures. <laughs> yeah. um, and at the time too, that was uh, I was 15 when my uh, grandfather passed away too. So you know there is that. It's a very interesting number that you talk about in a scene um, for the for the movie. Uh, so, what uh, other projects do you have in mind um, now that you're done with Copenhagen? Um, so, it's kind of, you know this is always a tricky question. Um, I have there's probably about three or four projects that I have I have going on right now. Um, in, in various stages of development, um, I'm attached to a script, pretty cool script about a, a about a female assassin, um, 45 year old female assassin who 
who goes home for the first time in 20 years and uh, for a job and finds her mother um, dying, uh, dying of cancer in the hospital, and her mother kind of asks her to, to euthanize her. So this is, you know, it's a story about forgiveness, and it's it's a very dark story, um, but it's, you know, it's an interesting kind of moral character study of an assassin uh, type story. So that's, you know, that that's written, I'm attached, and we're going out to cast right now. I'm also developing this kind of grounded sci-fi um, with a company out of L.A. that, that hopefully will pick up some legs, and there's a few other projects that that I'm uh, I'm either attached to or working on. It's just so um, it's just so tricky. I, the reason I don't like to get into them too too much is because just the nature of the business is uh-huh. you never know when any of these things can fall apart or go. And you know I don't want people expecting something that might not go for five ten years, might never go, or you know possibly right. go in six months. So I just kind of have to keep my options open. I'm being very selective and only, you know, only, um, and I hope you could see with Copenhagen, you know, there's something about the films I like to do. I like them to have a bit of a deeper meaning. Um, you know, I, I want them to resonate with audiences and and, and for people to, to think about them days after. My favorite my favorite questions I get in Q and A's are like, "What happens to the characters next?" or, you know, stuff <laughs> like that that makes them real in 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 the audience's head. And you know, that's kind of the type well, of stories I want to tell. I'll tell you why I'm not going to ask that question, because as somebody who's part of the audience, you shouldn't be the one telling me what happens next. I should imagine after you know the very ending, what happens next. It's what happens next for me and what I get out of the story. You know, exactly. and it's going to be different for each character. <laughs> uh, but I, I like yeah. how people, you know, we 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 always want to know what happens next with a character. Um, yeah. And you know, is I don't answer the question. My 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 my, you know, because it's because a lot of people associate it to like the before sunrise movie. I always just say you're going to have to wait nine years to find out. You know, but um, right. <laughs> But, uh, um, yeah. Okay, we got about two minutes left on uh, this show for uh, our interview, so I'm going to do a what is kind of a reoccurring theme on our show. Since we're a nerd show, um, and you can't tell us much more of what you're working on, um, we are really big about superhero movies and stuff, and it seems to be the golden age. If you had the chance to uh, write and direct a superhero movie, would you want to do a movie of an established superhero or villain, or being the writer and director, would you like to write your own and get that project off the ground? Well, I would say write my own, and I would say one of the, I don't wouldn't call quite call them superheroes, but almost in that realm. But one of the projects I am working on is is this kind of grounded sci-fi where we meet these people who have heightened abilities. Um, almost like superheroes. So, you know, I would love to be able to to write my own. But I I love superhero movies, um, especially when they're done right. I think there's so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you you could say what you want on this. We do not shy away. Ryan Reynolds, you're never allowed to do a superhero movie ever again. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we we asked that question a lot um, on the red carpet throughout the film festival, and it was interesting to you know, get to the different reactions. Uh, one of our favorites was doing a movie on the Joker, but from his perspective, not Batman. Oh, that's you cool. know, Yeah, I was like, I would definitely see that. So, um, Anyway, we're going to close the show out, and I want to thank, uh, thank you, Mark, for coming on and uh, telling us and talking with us about Copenhagen. Um, and wish you good luck in your future projects and also congratulations I hear that you and your wife are expecting a child. Yeah, exactly. That's unfortunately why I couldn't be uh I couldn't be in Dallas for the festival. My producer was there. But uh, any day now. So um <laughs> Well if really... you if you had to drop the phone all of a sudden because you was going into labor, we wouldn't hold it against you on this show. <laughs> we completely <laughs> understand. <laughs> so Thank you. Uh, and, thank and you again. Cool, we Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, if it's cool, I just would like to um, plug the website of the film where you can read all about it. It's just copenhagenthemovie.com. 
And there's also a SoundCloud where you can listen to the soundtrack. I know a lot of people are digging the soundtrack a lot. Um, it's but very yeah, you can good get all your updates. Yeah, you can get all your updates about when it might, you know, be available for audiences to see it at the website. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks again. We we'll, hopefully we'll be able to have you back on your next project. And right, nerds, great. thanks for having me. We're out of here. Mm-hmm.